This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. Uh, this is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, with John List, who is um, an economist at the University of Chicago, also chief economist at, at Lyft, formerly chief economist at uh, Uber, um, also the author of a couple books. The most recent book is called The Voltage Effect, How to Make Good Ideas Great and Great Ideas Scale. Also the author of uh, this book right here, The Y-Axis, along with uh, Yuri Genizzi. Um And... Uh, he, he, in this book, The Voltage Effect, John, you, you, um, you go from the White House to, to the White Sox. You go from University of Chicago to, to Uber. You know, you've had your, your toe in, in a lot of uh, different waters, which makes for, I think, a, a fascinating experience as an academic. Um, but you, you've really been instrumental in, in the creation of this field of experimental economics in the field, right? And so I really want to start off by, by talking about that because in, in the book, The Voltage Effect, you, you begin by talking about this kind of um, credibility crisis, which economics kind of went through. Uh, and, you know, in most sciences, we have, um, we have theoretical, we have empirical, and we have experimental ways of uncovering knowledge. And, you know, economics, it took a long time for them to kind of discover the, the experimental. And, and then when they, when they did, uh, it was kind of experiments in the lab and right. So Vernon Smith and, and others who, who, you know, won, won the Nobel prize a decade or so ago, right. They kind of pioneered that space. Um, but then of course the, the criticism is, well, you know, what about external validity, right? Like, okay, that works well in the lab, but you know, what about in the field? And so, so I remember when I first came to Berkeley in 2004, I was telling you earlier, you know, that's when my eyes were opened to this massive new growing discipline, which is kind of field experiments. So I was wondering if you could just kind of go back in time. You've had, you had a very unconventional academic journey. Um, how did you stumble on this, this idea of um, kind of doing field experiments uh, and, and doing them at, at scale? No, um, so, so thanks for having me today. So you're right. I, I think the word stumbled is appropriate. So my story really starts in the late 1980s when I was an undergrad student who was studying economics and on the side, every weekend, I was going to these baseball card conventions. And if any listeners don't know what I'm talking about, think of a big room. And in that big room are hundreds and hundreds of baseball card dealers and they stand behind a 10 foot table and customers walk around and they buy, sell and trade baseball, football, basketball cards. Okay. So I'm learning in the late eighties about supply and demand. I'm learning about neoclassical predictions and I take those learnings to the baseball card convention. And I examine them. I explore bargaining because there's a lot of higgling in these markets. I explore auctions. What's the best way to auction a good? And I start to make more and more money. Um, then I start to realize, well, economic theory doesn't always get it right. And I do more and more experiments. It spills over to the early 90s. And I get so fascinated with economics, I decide I want to go and get a PhD. At this point, I still am not aware of experimental economics as a field. I did become aware of it actually until I arrived in 1992 at the University of Wyoming to do my graduate training. And there I realized that this is an actual legitimate field whereby exactly as you say, people are bringing sophomores in college into the lab and they're exploring economic theories. So I'm thinking, wow, I was doing that, but at baseball card shows, not as sophisticated, but I was kind of doing it. I had control groups and treatment groups and I thought, wow, I could actually make a career out of using the world 
as my lab. And that would be my way of exploring whether our theories are right or wrong in the markets we care about. We kind of don't care really that much about sophomores in a classroom. We only care about that if that generalizes to areas that we find important. Now, I'm not going to tell you that baseball card markets are that important. They're not. But that's really where my career started. So in the early 90s and mid-90s now, nobody believed in field experiments. They were new. People thought that they didn't make sense. I was told several times, if you want to be an experimentalist, do it in the classroom. So I, I didn't have people who would fund my work. So what I did is I funded myself. I used my baseball card collection. And from Laramie, Wyoming, nearly every weekend or every other weekend, I would drive down to Denver and I would set up at baseball card shows as a dealer myself. And I would test economic theory while I was funding myself. And then I would bring that back and I would write it up as a set of academic papers. Now, for the first decade in my career, when you look all the way to like 2004, 2005, it's dominated by baseball card show experiments. Now, whether it's the economics of discrimination, whether it's gift exchange in markets, whether it's, you know, testing Vic Vickery's revenue equivalents, which type of auction uh, brings in the most revenue. That was a, a paper that David Lucking Riley wrote, one of my early co-authors. So this was all done basically in this market that I knew really well and I could test economic theory in my test tube, so to speak. Now, from there, of course, we expanded a lot. We expanded into starting our own pre-K programs, working with several firms, working with nonprofits, working with governments, which I'm sure we'll get to, but that that's sort of where I got started and how I got started. And now I think it's fair to say field experiments have been one of the major achievements within the field of economics, no doubt, in terms of how we generate data. Well, and I think this uh, kind of revolution in, in field of economics is paralleled by a couple of emergence of kind of, you know, big data and, um, you know, the use of experimentation in, in, in the, in the corporate world. Right. And so, you know, Billy Bean, right. And the use of data, I mean, granted a lot of the big data is not about experimentation. It's about kind of, you know, looking for, for patterns. Right. And, and, and that's, you know, correlations and not, not causation. So, but, but, you know, over time companies have taken the kind of let's test it out in Peoria sort of experiments and, and really kind of, kind of scaled them. But then we also have the hypothesis testing at, you know, for early stage companies to figure out like where they, they need, need to go. So, I mean, are, are these three kind of parallel developments? Um, is, is the theory influencing the, the practice or is the, the practice influencing the theory or is, you know, are all of these kind of driven by some, you know, external cause like the, you know, reduction in the cost of com computation or, you know, what's, why do we see these, these, these developments happening concurrently? Yep. Um, I, I think it is a, a theory to practice and practice to theory. And in part it's coincidental for me, I was raised in what's called the credibility revolution, which was more or less a revolution that when you have mounds and mounds of data, you should be serious about how you're identifying a causal effect, what's called internal validity. And the leaders there are just won the Nobel Prize, Josh and, uh, and David Card and Hito. And, and my contribution there was to say, I don't want to sit around and wait for the data to come to me and make those kinds of assumptions. What I want to do is I want to start with a theory and that theory should tell me where do I need exogenous variation? And then I will generate data using a field experiment to generate the variation that I need 
to speak to that theory. Now, that's basically how I got started. I start with a theory. I want to test it. Now, where my thinking has gone recently, especially with the voltage effect, is it's one thing to test a theory and figure out the mediation paths and the moderators, basically the mechanisms of causality, but it's altogether different to go from those learnings to something at scale. And when you're thinking about testing theory, a lot of times our first instinct is to do an efficacy test. You can think about in, in medicine, you, you give the drug its best shot. In economics, it's you give the theory its best shot. In medicine, they haven't figured out to where if it works, then you do phase one, phase two, phase three. In the social sciences, mm-hmm. unfortunately, we do an efficacy test and then we forget to tell everyone it was an efficacy test and we go on to a new problem and people are left with that idea and then they think it's going to scale and and we don't do the necessary testing to make sure it's not a false positive or to make sure it works in different settings or for different people and in that way my proposal in the book is that we should look at scale what the program has to look like with its flaws or with the constraints we have at scale And we should bring those constraints back to the Petri dish and we should see if our our idea still works with those constraints in place. And when it does, you scale it. If it doesn't, you need to tweak it. Or you you at least need to understand that the idea isn't as great as what you think it's going to be in the efficacy test with these constraints in place. So in that way, All of these things are sort of coming together because you had evidence-based policy in the 90s and the last few decades. What I'm talking about here is policy-based evidence. I'm talking about what are the practical difficulties or constraints that you have at scale, bring those back and see if the idea still works. So in that way, it's going to be practice speaking back to the science and then science speaking back to how we should practice this. a a huge um, improvement uh, in decision-making to introduce the, the concept of, you know, Hey, data, science, evidence, right? So, you know, if we think back to the, the, you know, the Billy Bean story, which I always start my data and decisions class with, right? Like, you know, just moving away from, from gut and, and persuasiveness, like that's a huge improvement, but it's really only the first step, right? Because, you know, you can, you can have these, these wonderful, uh, you can reference these wonderful studies. You can reference these wonderful pilots, but you know, if they don't scale or if they are not representative, then, um, you know, you're going to go down the, the wrong path and maybe you'll do so with a lot more confidence than you would if you were just doing it based on, on, on gut. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's a very important point is that the first step is actually generating or obtaining data that can inform your decision-making process. Now, that's a great step, but it's also a, a step that can be, be very seductive in the sense that you think mm-hmm. you're making the right decision and it can actually be counterproductive to what you're trying to do if your data are generated in a way where they don't really tell you what you want to learn, or if the data are actually giving you the wrong signal. So you actually think you're doing something good, but you, you would have been better off if you don't take care, um, by just Mm -hmm. using your gut. Uh, because a lot of times if you don't take proper care with data, you absolutely run down the wrong path and you know, as Twain once said, once you have ignorance and confidence, success is ensured. The data tend to give people a lot of confidence. And if they use it in an ignorant way, it's almost like you're running full steam with a bunch of confidence. And that's a tough person to stop. Well, so sometimes I wonder why, 
that some of the things that we teach in kind of literally, you know, day one of a, an MBA program, right? You know, why, why are some of these things, which seem so obvious, you know, why does it, why don't they stick, right? Particularly when we're talking about even, you know, super smart people in industry or in academia. So, you know, when in a very, in the first week of a course on say statistics or econometrics or, you know, data, you're going to learn about it. You say, okay, this is right. I get it. I get it. And then, you know, of statistics. And of course, this is just only one of the, the many ways. Why is it? And then I guess also when we think about some of the behavioral things, I mean, we caution against um, confirmation bias, right? Literally on like, you know, day one of, of, a, of an MBA program and people nod their heads. And, and then, it, you know, and particularly like, you know, behavioral scientists, behavioral scientists, we think about the, the replication crisis in, in social psychology, right? Social psychologists, yeah. they know about confirmation bias better than anybody else on the planet. And yet, right, the entire replication crisis seems to be an illustration that the, the experts in the field have kind of, you know, forgotten they, they have to take their own medicine. So, so how, do, how do we explain this? It's, it seems kind of puzzling. No, no, I think it's a great point. So, so I just have two thoughts. Um, the, the first thought is when you look at the incentives in our social knowledge creation market, there is very little incentive to replicate in the social sciences. Now, in the hard sciences, they have it figured out. You, you have an innovation and it gets published in maybe Science or Nature magazine. The first replication is published in Science or Nature, and the second re replication are also published in Science and Nature, and then they sort of figure out what are the boundary conditions to that result, and those get published in field journals. That's great. The reason why that's great is because when you think about it from a Bayesian perspective, nearly every surprising result that's published in a journal is probably wrong. And it's wrong because to be surprising, you probably start with a prior of like 1%. Right. And if you have even a well-powered experiment, that 1% only goes to like 2%. So it's still like a one in 50 shot. But policymakers and decision makers think if it's published in a peer-reviewed journal, it's the truth. And it must be exactly like that. And it's just not. They're, they're not thinking about it in a very cogent way. And it's because we like to do shortcuts in our thinking, um, in which I'll come back to critical thinking in a moment, but let's stick with the first point. Now, also within that scientific knowledge creation market, you more or less get penalized when you try to replicate someone. Now, what I, what I mean is right away, if you don't replicate someone, there's no good journal to publish it in. But you also make an enemy. So when you call somebody up and say, you know, can I have your data or can I have your experimental instructions? I want to try to replicate the work. That person's heart starts to beat a little bit faster. And, and I've tried to replicate people's work and I, I see how they treat me afterwards. It's almost like they're not happy that I'm trying to replicate their work. That needs to change. If somebody's actually reading your work and trying to replicate it, you should take that as a compliment and you should be rewarded when people replicate your work. That doesn't happen in the social sciences. Um, we need to think about the reward system on both the demand side and the supply side to replications and make sure that that changes. It's starting to change in social psychology and it's starting to come to econ as well. Now, when I say replication, I mean from getting the person's data and code all the way up to generating new data to see not only within their population does it work, but also in other populations of people and situations. Those are all types of replications. Okay, so I think that's point number one. In our scientific area, the incentives are just so misaligned to do it the right way. And then that's what we end up with is we have to have revolutions to lead to more replications. And then I, now I think secondly, what you brought up earlier was, you know, John, should social psychologists of all people know that confirmation bias, et cetera? Absolutely. 
But I also think that people tend to what Kahneman would call think fast and they use heuristics and they think very quickly. They want to do something, then they move on. And in that way, the critical thinking skills of everyone needs to fundamentally change to make sure that when we have evidence, not only when we produce it, but also when we read it, um, can we use proper critical thinking skills? So I just wrote a paper on critical thinking and I developed a critical thinking hierarchy. And most of my students and most policymakers that I work with and business leaders that I work with are sort of on level one and level two, where level one is what I call a modal thinker. You're, uh, you're susceptible to all the biases, especially confirmation bias. And level two is what I call a neophyte. You just begin to understand correlation versus causality. Most people who are fast thinkers, it's not easy to get past these two early stages and be what I call an, an adept thinker and then a great thinker because it's hard. And, and you are typically not rewarded for being a deep critical thinker. You're typically rewarded for quick, quick thought, um, quickly saying what you think, and then you move on and, and no one remembers. But, but that part of our pedagogy within economics in, in the business and government world, I think can stand for a transformation. And to me, that's all about teaching appropriate critical thinking skills. Well, I, you know, I absolutely agree. We, we, um, I mean, I think in the MBA programs, we think of ourselves as teaching, you know, critical thinking skills and, and, you know, this last couple of years, I introduced a, um, introductory workshop specifically on critical thinking before the MBA students Very even good. start their, their program. But, uh, you know, there was one story in the book that I really was blown away by. Um, and it, it confirmed some things that, 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 you know, I, I've, I've been thinking, which is this memo that you wrote when you were at Lyft. Right. Yeah. And it was, you know, think on the margin. And I'm thinking, yeah. look, you know, introductory microeconomics class that we force every one of our MBA students to take in the very beginning of the program. Like the entire class, all, you know, seven weeks of it, it can be summarized with think on the margin, right? <laughs> like we, and we, we, we drum it into them like over and over and over again. And we have exercise after exercise and exam after exam all about, you know, thinking on the, on the margin. And, and I think that that might be one of the, I don't know, half a dozen critical things that you hope people take away from this MBA program. But it, but it's amazing to me that, that something as simple as that right. Can just add so much value if, if you, if you get everybody to think like that. And, and we, we emphasize the, 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 you know, Hey, you know, you need to have like eighth level Python skills if you, if you want to work, but, um, but yeah, uh, you know, thinking on the margin, that's not important. Like why, why is it that I, I kind of think that what you're describing with critical thinking, it, it's like a tune up. Everybody needs to kind of periodically go back and get a tune up and be reminded of these, you know, just, just super basic things like going to the doctor and having your, you know, heartbeat checked. I mean, how, how is it yeah. possible that you could add so much value with, with a memo that just kind of states what, what a lot of us think of as obvious? Yeah, states the obvious. You're exactly right. Um, so, so I have, I have kind of two observations on this and, and let me start by saying that when you get to be my age, I've worked in a lot of different settings. So I worked in the White House 20 years ago for a year and a half is, uh, at the Council of Economic Advisors. I've worked for dozens of firms, um, from United Airlines to Uber, Lyft, uh, Facebook, Google, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've worked for a lot of governments, uh, beyond the U.S. government, uh, the Behavioral Insights team, I was part of that early on in the U.K., I work with uh, the Australian government, several local governments, and in each of those venues, my biggest value added is always economics 101 arguments. It goes all the way back to the White House, th sitting in the Roosevelt Room and talking about whether we should have a carbon tax. I, I was really pushing the carbon tax back then, as was Greg Mankiw who was a chair of the Council of Economic Advisors during my second part. The first part was Glenn Hubbard. Um, 
you would win arguments using the logic of Econ 101 because it's so powerful. And in many cases, it's not the way people think by instinct. Typically, people think in averages. Like, I was just sitting in the room the other day at, at Lyft, in the boardroom, and people presented averages. So here's what I mean by presenting averages. It was the, the driver act team. So what the driver act team does is they have a big budget to spend to acquire new drivers mm -hmm. to come in and drive for Lyft. That's a heartbeat of, of our company. We have to have a lot of drivers, a thick market. So they put up a slide. The slide said, at Google, we spent roughly $483 on average to bring in a driver. But on Facebook, we spent roughly $450 on average to bring in the driver. So this, this would be your CAC, except when, when you think of the customers as the driver. Exactly. As the driver. This is what's always mm -hmm. presented is an average. Now, I raised my hand and I said to them, what about the last 10 drivers on Google and the last 10 drivers on Facebook? Then they said, well, we don't really have that, but we can go get it for you and send it to the group. So they did that. And what happens is, is on Facebook, the last 10 drivers were about $800 per driver to bring in. And the last 10 drivers on Google were like $400. That's marginal mm -hmm. thinking that now you're saying, well, wait, should we move that $800 from Facebook over to Google? Because we're going to get twice as many drivers. And they said, oh, we've never thought of it like that. The exact same thing happened and you read about it in the voltage effect when i call it my john nash moment um looking at at cleaning up of hazardous and non-hazardous um areas in the states people present those data looking at averages and then they say because the averages are roughly in the same ballpark we must be doing things right it's not first instinct to say, I'm going to look at the last one or the last hundred or the last thousand and compare that to the average. It's just We just don't do that. And the reason why we don't do that is because we weren't taught to do that. We were taught to think on the margin. I wrote a Principles of Economics book and one of the tenets went with Daron Asimuglu and David Lapson. And one of the tenets is think on the mm -hmm. margin. But well, people learn, think on the margin, it's really hard for the human mind to apply that concept to their state of play, whether it's the White House or the boardroom or wherever. It's not an easy concept to say, I'm going to use marginal thinking. And then how does marginal thinking suggest I should think through this problem? That's a part that we tend not to teach. So now that I, I taught that at Lyft, exactly what you're talking about, I call it the Adam Smith visits Lyft memo. But, but I should be clear about this. The only reason why I got traction with that memo, right away, everyone ignored it. And they said, oh, yeah, whatever, the economist uh, talking about this crazy stuff. It worked because of COVID. And once an organization has a shock, so we had 22% of our people were let go when COVID started. 22% of employees at Lyft were, were let go. At that point, Logan Green, the CEO and founder, co-founder, said, we need to tighten the belt. So we also need to think about where we are going to lower expenses. Voila, that's the Adam Smith memo. Mm -hmm. Where should we lower our expenditures? Adam Smith tells you, lower it in the spot where you have the fewest marginal benefits. In our Google and Facebook example, it's lower it on Facebook. Don't lower it on Google 
and that's going to lead us to a better spot. So what I've also learned in organizations is once they have a shock, that's your moment that you have to seize because that's when you can make deep impact. When there's not a shock, it's much more difficult, even though you can show people it and then they'll say, okay, we'll kind of switch that a little bit. But because it's hard, they tend not to do it unless there's something real at stake. Well, I, and I think this highlights the importance of uh, generalist thinking, right? So, you know, I, I teach a lot of MBAs and I tell them, hey, you know, don't be intimidated by experts, right? Because as a generalist, if you understand these basic economic principles, you know, you can, you can add, certainly add value by interrogating kind of what the experts are doing. And, and I'm, I'm teaching a, a course this spring on um, COVID economics at Stanford. And, um, you know, I'm not an epidemiologist and, and, and I'm not a virologist, right? But, but it seems like, you know, as an economist, you, could, you can look at some of these things and say, wait, hold on a second, right? I mean, I'm thinking in terms of, you know, thinking on the margin, if we're going to spend $8 trillion, like, hey, maybe we should think about, right, you know, what has the biggest impact? And, and that's, that's one observation. The other one gets back to, you know, this idea of, you know, pharmaceutical versus non-pharmaceutical interventions. It seems like, you know, in, in, on, the, on the pharmaceutical side, we have these procedures in place, right? We have clinical trials, we, we have null hypotheses, you know, we have all this stuff. And then for the non-pharmaceutical, we're just kind of like, let's just, you know, do whatever, you know, we think is going to work. Uh, and so when these two things are, are substitutes for one another, and we have different levels of, of proof across the different, uh, you know, tool sets, um, you know, we're, we're going to get some, some bizarre results. So, so how do we kind of make, um, the, the, so like the, the policy and how, you know, work, you worked in the white house. How, how can we, is it unrealistic to think that we can make policy more, more scientific? Um, is, are the forces arrayed against that just too, too strong? Um, you know, you, you, you talk about the, the, the dare program. Yeah. Um, do you think that the, the dare program, uh, you could, I'd, I'd love to hear you, you know, recount that story. Is, is that really fundamentally a failure to understand the, the, you know, the scaling problem or is it, are the kind of political forces so strong that nobody really cares if, if, if it's, uh, if it, if it scales or not? Yeah, that's, uh, the, the, you know, within what you just said are, uh, are a bunch of good questions. So let me try to unpack some of it. And if I don't, um, if I don't pick it all up, make sure you push me at the end because you have three or four very important points in that statement. But let's let's first level set and talk about the D.A.R.E. program, and, and then we'll sort of go from there. So in, in the Voltage Effect book, I talk about false positives as one of the very important components of scaling. So I want you to think about false positives as there was never a voltage to begin with. And... Mm -hmm. The example that I use in public policy is Nancy Reagan. And I use Nancy Reagan not only because she was a wonderful first lady. And when I worked in the White House, she would come and visit a lot. And one of the most genuine, wonderful people in the world who really wanted to change the world for the better. So she decided to take on the drug problem amongst youth back in the mid eighties. So it was, a, it was a little bit about a little bit like the opioid crisis now where in the mid eighties, there was a serious problem with teens using drugs. So Nancy Reagan decided to hitch her wagon to an education program called dare or just say no. And I can still remember like it was yesterday, a program officer coming to my high school and they stood in front of the classroom and said, just say no. And here's why you should just say no. And they spun out their educational intervention. I looked at my teacher and I said, look, I don't use drugs, but I have a lot of friends who do, and there's no way this is working. And my teacher said, oh, John, you should be quiet. There's, uh, there's evidence behind this. You know, at this point, it would be great to tell the audience the evidence was like 10 people in treatment and five in control, but that's not true. There was actually 
pretty strong evidence from Honolulu. They, they did an RCT on roughly like 1,775 kids, and they found pretty good signal that it worked. The problem was the incentives were not in the system to double check. Let, let's see if that's a false positive. If they would have, they would have found there was really no voltage there. It was just the data line. And the way we do our statistical work is embedded, there is statistical error. In this case, it's called alpha, and they'll set at 5%, and Nancy Reagan just got really unlucky. She would sit on the couch from the West Wing with Ronald Reagan, and she would look into the television screen and say, just say no. I remember. And she was convinced, right, Gregory? She was convinced. Problem was we spent millions and millions of dollars and a bunch of time. That's even more important, the opportunity cost of time. We just spent all kinds of time working on a program that just didn't work. Now, I see that everywhere. Every organization I go to, whether it's Chrysler or United, Uber, whatever, once you have something that looks like it works and it conforms to our intuition of the world, then we want everyone to get it right away. I, if I had a nickel for every time I had to stop a decision maker and say, let's roll this out as a test just to make sure it will work, mm -hmm. I'd be a billionaire. It's amazing how everyone wants to run really fast right away. It's kind of the move fast and break things mentality where I've worked with a lot of fast runners, but if they're running the wrong way, they never reach the finish line. We, we know that. And a lot of times we set up these policies in ways that it's very difficult to figure out if they're working or not. And it takes decades and decades. Once you figure out it's not working, then you have to go in and there are a lot of entrenched interests and a lot of resources at stake so it's almost impossible to undo a bad idea. And in many cases, it should have never been scaled in the first place. Now, when it comes to policymakers, I, I think that we literally need to set up a checklist and say, here are things we need to check off to make sure that this is the actual truth. It works for the right people. It works in the right situation. It doesn't have massively bad spillovers. The, the cost function is one that we can appreciate. You know, it doesn't have severe diseconomies of scale. And once we have the checklist, much like, look, when I was in the White House, every economically significant rulemaking had to undergo a formal benefit cost test. Now you can say, well, what's an economically significant rulemaking? Back then, it was a proposed rule that had either $150 million annual million dollars of annual benefits or annual cost. That regulation had to undergo a formal benefit cost analysis. Back then, there were about 80 of them a year, and I did a lot of them myself. We should have the exact same safeguards in place around scaling, and I give you the ingredients and the playbook in the voltage effect that if you check these five boxes, it's good to go. Now, now we kind of understand where it can scale, who it can scale for, because I think on the sidelines of a lot of public policy in the past has been the equity issue. A lot of times we just sum dollars of benefits, sum dollars of cost, and we tend to short shrift who are the winners and who are the losers. I think it's very simple, right? That's, that's my uh, final sign. Number two is a representativeness of the population. Who's this working for? Who's this hurting? And a proper accounting of that, I think we're, we're to that world now where we're starting to appreciate not only the total level of benefits and costs, but also who are the winners and losers in a very important way. These should all be basically part of the accounting exercise that when we check those five boxes in my book, now we're ready.
No, we can be serious about this is an idea. This is a policy that can scale. Business leaders should do the same thing. When I, when I talk to VC folks, they like what I'm putting together because they say, wow, I didn't really think of it like that. And when we're talking about false positives, you know, we're always afraid of dupers. And then some VCs right. will hire uh, ex-FBI agents to figure out, you know, is this Elizabeth Theranos or, or can this be the truth? It's, it's a real yeah. issue in nearly every walk of life. Well, a lot of companies actually have in place kind of like formal, um, experiment, uh, programs where anybody who wants to kind of run an experiment has to kind of check in with the experiment office. Uh, you talk about how, you know, there's more science happening in a company like Uber than there is at University of Chicago, right? There's like massive amounts of, of science happening, but you know, even, even there, right, there's all sorts of flaws in, in the way the experiments are run, where the person who's running the experiment is also in charge of kind of evaluating the, the experiment. So, so I was wondering if you could kind of distinguish between, right, proper experimental design, right, at the, at the very earliest stages, right, so to make sure that you're not, um, you know, sampling incorrectly or whatever, and then kind of this, this ongoing, what you call implementation science, right? So it seems like in addition to having a good solid experiment at the get-go, what, what you really need to do is you need to also roll these things out in a way that allows you to continue to, to, to learn and, and update. Right. And it seems like that, even if you get the, the, the experiment kind of right at the beginning, um, if, if you're not kind of continuing to learn. So, I mean, I'm thinking like here with, you know, with Pfizer and Moderna, right. They, they did the, did the trial. And then as soon as they did the trial, they're like, all right, now let's just vaccinate everybody. And it's like, well, boom, now we just lost out on an opportunity to, to see what the, you know, two year, three year effect is. Cause we did all the work of creating these, these different, you know, cohorts that are more or less identical. And, and, and now like, you know, we, we just, we just missed out, right? Like if you're going to roll something out, let's roll something out in a systematic way so that we can, we can just, you know, learn in continuous time. So so do we, do we need, I mean, that's a couple of things. I no, no, you're, brought up, you're but... right. No, no, these are excellent. Let, let me start from the back end and then go, go backwards to, to where you started because, you know, when I, when I first started to explore scaling, I, I started with economic theory and I wanted to learn about you know, what are the underpinnings of the knowledge creation market that might be in place that cause us not to be able to scale? And then from there, I said, let's be serious about empirical work to figure out if the theory is right or wrong and what are the signatures of ideas that do scale and the signatures of ideas that don't scale. Those are what I call the five vital signs in the, in the book. And one big obstacle that I continuously faced was there are so many new policies that are rolled out in a manner that makes it impossible to tell whether the policy works or not. And whenever I give policymaking talks, I always chastise policymakers and say, your job does not end when you adopt a program. For a scientist, that's where your job should begin because you should at least give us a chance, whether it's a natural experiment, regression discontinuity, PSM, the propensity score matching, or like a, a, a full-blown RCT. I think about it as a hierarchy. You know, each of these, they have different assumptions to have internal validity. Just give us a chance mm. because there are so many rollouts. Like just stagger the rollout, do something. Um, there, but there are so many opportunities that have been lost because of how policymakers and decision makers have rolled out their ideas. Now that's different from mm -hmm. when you roll something out, set it, set it up so you can continuously learn that you should do both. Um, and continuously learning David Chambers in the implementation science literature 
just has several really nice papers about how you should set it up to continuously learn. Okay, so so that's point one. Now, point two, going back to if you think about an organization, and whether it's a for-profit or non-profit or governmental organization, you should be thinking about setting up your data generation in your discovery in a very systematic way, because right now most organizations have it messed mm -hmm. up exactly as you pointed out. The creator of the knowledge has an incentive to choose a group that gives them the largest treatment effect or choose a situation that you know could work or, you know, present maybe something that isn't fully powered. And then they have a really large treatment effect, or they don't correct for multiple hypothesis testing, or just a suite of things to, that might even maximize type one error. Now, we need to set it up to where the originator, of course, right now the incentives are set up. If you ship a product, you get a bonus at the end of the year, and then it's shipped in a way that's really hard to tell whether it had a deep impact. Before doing that, there needs to be a second or third team in the org that explores that. And they not only explore whether it's a false positive, these are the bias disruptors. Absolutely. I call them at, at Uber, I call them the gatekeepers because they keep the gate of information that will not go to Travis, uh, Travis Kellenick at the time. He was a CEO at, at Uber when I was there. These would be like journal Nothing referees. Go, pardon me? These would be like, like, like journal referees. Yeah. Exactly. Nothing should go to TK. Nothing should be printed in journals before the tires are properly kicked. So the gatekeepers of knowledge in a way that we make sure we understand, is it causal? Who does it work for? Under what situation does it work? And what should be the proper dosage? And importantly, like at Uber, so, so my team was responsible for rolling out tipping at, at Uber. And, and that story, as I tell it in, in the voltage effect, is, you know, January 27th, President Trump puts out yeah. an executive order on immigration. And... People went nuts when this happened. I don't know if you remember, January 27th of 2017, President Trump puts out an executive order, a bunch of cab drivers around JFK strike. And in response, Uber did something that they thought was a good thing, but it totally backfired. What they did is they announced that we are going to turn off surge around JFK, which that was a company policy. Whenever a hurricane blows through or is a natural disaster, we want to be seen as a company that doesn't price gouge. That's literally what happened. But the market perceived it in an altogether different way. The market perceived it as a way that Uber was trying to take advantage and break up the, the taxi cab revolt. So that evening, a taxi cab driver wrote hashtag delete Uber. That went viral. And at this moment, Lyft was basically on the mat. They were killed across nearly every market. Uber was dominating Lyft. That lifeline, the delete Uber lifeline literally saved Lyft. And at that moment, Travis came to us and said, we need to get drivers back. How should we get drivers back? And my argument was, we need to have tipping on our app because drivers believe tipping is a good thing and they believe they will make more money with tipping. And then a few other execs jumped on board and Travis said, okay, is one of the things that we do, the suite of elements we're going to do for drivers is we will add tipping in the app. Okay. So we tested that with 5% of the drivers in a market. Guess what happened? The wages went up and drivers worked more. That's econ 101, labor supply, elasticity was like 0.4. So everyone's happier.
Now, when we rolled that out to the entire market, guess what happened? It came to a new equilibrium whereby, sure, there were more drivers, but there were so many more drivers that it undid all the good stuff on the wage mm -hmm. side. So now drivers are driving around more often, but they're empty more often, and it exactly offset the wage increase that mm -hmm. we observed earlier. Now, that's a general equilibrium effect that... It's a composition absolutely. fallacy, right? I mean, it, it's absolutely. Right? It's like the the example I use in class is, you know, if you if you put the put the like, um, you know, ping pong ball on your antenna in in the parking lot to make your car stick out, you know, it only works as long as you know you're the it, only one doing it. Right? Exactly. <laughs> you know, in our early experiments, what we do is we take a group of people and we put half in treatment, half in control, and we say this is the effect. But when you scale something, what you really want is you want to take all the people and put them in treatment versus all the people and put them mm -hmm. in control. But that's difficult now because it's hard mm -hmm. to do that right away. And then it's hard to get the counterfactual. So it's easy to see though, in with some ideas that there will be these general equilibrium effects that can undo all the good stuff. And that's, that's basically what vital sign number four is is you really need to understand what are the complete spillovers and general equilibrium effects when we scale something all the way up. Hard question, but something you really need to recognize. And economic theory, I think, in many cases helps us. And what also helps us is if you slowly scale, so say you scale with 5%, then 25%, then 50 and you look at what happens, that kind of gives you a good idea about where the train is going. Because you're going to be switching around maybe around 70, 75%. You're not doing all the good stuff. Now you kind of know uh, about what's happening because of these spillover effects. Well, I mean, spillovers, this is one of the areas where I think that, um, you know, experimental economics has really made headway um, because, you know, when you're taking a purely, say, scientific approach, right, your, your goal is to control for everything except the causal mechanism that you're interested in, right? And, and that's a very different thing from saying like, yeah. what is the impact, right? So, you know, if, if for instance, uh, you, you've isolated that, Hey, taking this, this pill will, um, if everyone complies, what will actually have a desired effect, but in reality, no one's yeah. going to comply. Right. Then, you know, what's the point, right? I mean, you know, the question is, does this, uh, I noticed there was some, some studies about like interventions around yeah. mask wearing. And, uh, th there showed no results. And of course the, the criticism is, well, yeah, but they didn't really wear the mask. <laughs> so the pill. <laughs> like, right. So, so if the question is like, do masks work? That's a very different question from like, do mask interventions work? Right. And, and the only thing, the only thing we have control over are the interventions. And so, so, so in, in some sense, we're asking very different questions, but if we mistake the answer for the first question for the answer to the second question, you know, we're going to wind up making, you know, stupid stupid decisions, right? No, I think that's, I think that's a very important point. And when I, you know, went on this process of thinking about scaling, the medical literature was extremely instructive and it's extremely instructive mm -hmm. because of medication adherence. And what the medical community faces is a very, very difficult question and problem. And, I, and I've, I've helped Humana Insurance with this for years, so I should, I should let your listener, listeners know that. Um, and I haven't been able to crack that nut in most cases because, mm -hmm. you know, it's one thing in, a, in an efficacy test or phase one, phase two, or phase three when they're all taking the medicine. And you can see the mediation path and you, you can get the moderators, but it's a totally different world when you roll it out and only 20% of the people take the pill every day, like they should 40% take it every three days and the rest of them never take it. Even when it's by their bedside, you know, then we do reminder text reminders, we pay mm -hmm. them. Uh, we give them rewards and that increases medication adherence a little bit, but, but that's the true efficacy test is in the field, how is the medicine working? And then that's the entire set of flaws 
that's with COVID has the same thing. The, the vaccination works, but how do we get it in people's arms? That's a part that's not working. And that's the kind of the beautiful part about what Jonah Salk did. Because back in the day, I use that as an example of something that truly did scale. You know, Salk starts by doing experiments with his kids. And then he finds that it works. He then does experiments with other people's kids. He finds that it's not a false positive. He then finds that it works for all kids. So the, the population is great. But then he has a hard problem because his problem is, and society's problem is, how do we get it in people's arms? Here's a beautiful thing that they did back then. They said, well, look, when people have children, have a baby, they will bring the baby back for the six month checkup, bring the baby back for 12 months, bring the baby back for a year and a half, et cetera. We need to leverage the healthcare system in that moment to give the vaccinations because very few people are going to skip their child's six month checkup, right? We, we, as humans, we tend not to take very good care of ourselves. We'll, we'll skip the dentist, we'll skip the doctor, but we won't skip the doctor for our six month checkup for our baby because that's something that really hurts. So why not leverage the healthcare system to give them the polio vaccination? It's exactly what we do. So, so there, the big impediment to scaling, which is what we face with COVID, is taken care of because we're leveraging the healthcare system. And, and that's extremely important in many cases, when you have a treatment that works, how do we convince people to actually take it up? And, and that's just as important in the element of scaling as it is to innovate the treatment itself. Because if you don't have a good treatment or if you don't have people taking it up, either one will render you useless. So that's a very important part of scaling many, many interventions is making sure people take the medicine. The ones that really work well are ones that you naturally take the program and the program is naturally in some other setting that everyone's going to partake in or everyone's going to participate in. Those are elements of the situation that tend to matter a lot. Well, I think that this, this change in thinking in, in the area of policy driven by kind of the nudge movement is, 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 is in many ways, um, about accepting people as they are, right. And saying, look, you know, there are real people and then there are like theoretical people. And, and, you know, we, we do policy for, for real people. And, and it seems, you know, I used to teach law and in, in law, we, we accept people as they are, right? Like you, if you manufacture a product, like a lawnmower, you know, and everybody's getting their toes cut off, like you, you can't say, well, a rational person wouldn't, you know, stick their toes under there, you know, <laughs> like you, you have to say, well, you know, this people are the way they are and, and you got to work around them. Right. And, and so it's, it's sort of, um, an acceptance of, of the limitations of the, of the people you're, no, you're I, dealing I think with, that's right? a wonderful point. And, and in the book, we talk about, um, smart thermostats and, um, mm -hmm. what's brilliant. So this is a, a paper that we haven't, uh, released publicly yet, but I think by the time your, your listeners hear this, I hope it's, it's released. It's, it's titled smart technology, dumb humans, because what happens is we get these brilliant in very large engineering estimates around some types of technologies. And the technology that we look at are these smart thermostats that people put in their homes. And they call them smart because they automatically moderate the temperature in a way mm -hmm. that takes account of both when you're in the house, when you're sleeping, when it's expensive to provide the heat or the cooling, and they're just brilliant. So they put them in people's houses and we do a large scale experiment and we find there's no effect. Even though the engineers tell us there should be a huge effect, we find no effect. Here's what happens. The engineers think that people are like Dr. Spock, that, that, right? The, these unswervingly rational beings who can maximize the most hardest problem 
in the drop of a hat when really most of us are Homer Simpson. And what Homer Simpson does in this case is Homer undoes the presets in the smart thermostat in a way that undoes all the good stuff. So we need to understand at scale, here's what's going to happen to the technology. The dumb humans are likely going to undo it. So we should spend a ton of money, which we have done in many technologies, assuming the human is smart when they're really dumb. And that sort of understand, this is what I was talking about earlier, understand what your constraints are at scale or at rollout. In this particular case, understand the modal person is Homer Simpson. The modal person is not Dr. Spock. So what we should do then is create the product. First of all, test it with Homer Simpson and find when it doesn't work, you don't roll it out. You have to do a tweak and you have to roll it out for Homer Simpson, not Dr. Spock. I don't under, this is what I refer to as policy-based evidence rather than evidence-based policy. There needs to be a revolution that we think very hard about policy-based evidence. And I think there's a lot of insights here for entrepreneurs, right? So, um, you know, the whole entrepreneurial ecosystem is, is about running experiments, right? I, I always tell my, I teach, of course, on venture capital. And I, I, I always say that, you know, the CEO of a startup, uh, CEO stands for chief experiment officer, yeah. right? And, and, you know, they're, they're running experiments and the venture capitalists are essentially the, the, the ones that are funding the lab, yeah. right? And, and so it's fun. It's really up to the venture capitalists to scrutinize the, the experiments, but a lot of entrepreneurs do, as you know, you say in, in the book, they cherry pick their, their results, right? Cause they really, really want to, sometimes it's, it's semi-intentional because they really want to get the next round of funding, but, but, but usually it's just their confirmation bias. Yeah. You know, they, they pick the, they, they, they get these beachhead customers, these early adopters and, and they get some great signals and, uh, and then they get really excited. Um, but, but, you know, they haven't tried it out on grandma. Right. And, and so th they, they completely overestimate the, um, uh, the likely success of, of their, their initiative. So, you know, do the CEOs of these startups, do they really need to learn about kind of proper experimentation or is it kind of the, really the role of the, the venture capitalist to serve as the, the, the journal editor in this case and, uh, you know, supervise the, the design of these experiments? No, I think, I think it's all of the above. Um, and, and you're right. It, it's one thing to generate data and we all are more or less believers in experimentation now, but it's a whole different thing to make proper inference from the data. The, the role of selection, not only of selection of people, it, it's also selection of situations. In a lot of our data, we find that the situation is just as important as the population of people. Now, a lot of times, even though they forget it, entrepreneurs in the back of their mind do have like extent of market. It doesn't work for young women or young men, et cetera. Um, and then in their experiments, they at least try to block on people. And what I mean by block is you stratify on old, young, black, white, uh, sexual orientation, whatever. And you kind of determine extent of market. They don't do that as much as they should, but they at least have an inkling that they should. In a lot of cases, they don't do that same thing on situation. So for mm -hmm. example, in, in Chicago Heights, uh, we, we started an early childhood program. One of the key features of that, we needed really good teachers, but we didn't do the experiment mm -hmm. with really bad teachers because when you scale that thing up, it's one thing to hire 30 teachers. It's an altogether different thing to hire 30,000 teachers. If you want to withhold the, you know, the same budget line, you're going to get a lot of really, really bad teachers. That's part of the situation now, part of the product that if we didn't explore that early on, we're not getting the right signal. And it happens both with customer type, but it happens with situation type.
uh, whether it's an apology program or a tipping program that we developed at Uber, or whether it's a public policy. I, I think it's about the CEO and the VC that really needs to understand these are the pitfalls of an idea. And do these pitfalls render our idea unscalable or do they render it scalable, but at a different level than what we had hoped? Selection is really, really powerful. Selection of data to believe. A lot of times, as exactly as you said, confirmation bias is important. Correspondence bias is important. Um, and we tend as humans and as fast thinkers, we tend just to believe what we think is true. And we cherry pick data, cherry pick situations to conform to our expectations. Mm -hmm. And then we run the wrong way in many cases. But I, I actually think this is a checks and balances. I think you want to inform everyone along the decision-making channel that these are features or vital signs that you need to be aware of. And look, in many ways, you're a new kind of academic that we're seeing um, someone who is comfortable in the academic world and in the private sector, right? And, you know, you move fluidly between the two, uh, not just sort of sequentially, but, you know, in, in parallel. Um, and, um, you know, you mentioned that when you first arrived at Uber and you saw the sign on the wall that said kind of, you know, data is in our DNA, you, you said, well, wow, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm like at home here. And it turns out that, you know, the quantity and quality of the experimentation that's happening in the private sector in many ways exceeds that of what's happening in, in universities. It is, is this a, is this a, how, how do you appraise this new development? Because a lot of the experiments that are being done, the results are not being public, publicized, right? I remember in the early days of Facebook, they had a research group and, and they did all sorts of really interesting experiments. They partnered with academics to run these experiments. And then there was a lot of pushback. And so now all the results are pretty much kept in house and, and we, we don't see as many of the insights. Um, it, does this kind of shift of the center of the gravitational center of research away from universities and into companies, is, is that sort of, you know, depriving us of, of the ability to advance scientifically or is there kind of enough rotation yeah. of people around through all these different companies with everybody switching jobs that ultimately all the, all the knowledge gets you know, gets, gets dif diffused in any event? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So let me start by making a bold claim. And, and my bold claim is that academics are the most underutilized resource in the world. Yeah, right. Okay. I know you do stuff for, for like, uh, you know, academics will work for free and almost just in exchange for data and publication. Exactly. You, th their pay is in data. Now you can say, well, why does a firm need an academic if the firm is also at the frontier and they're doing more experiments than what the academic does or what the academic has experience in doing? The, the one secret behind firm experimentation is that it tends to stop with a B testing and the inherent flaw in stopping at a B testing is that you then don't learn about the underlying mechanisms at work. So the reason why I titled the first book with Uri, the Y axis is because the beautiful aspect of field experimentation is it allows us to go beyond measurement. Now, if you look at a natural experiment or regression discontinuity or PSM or any exploration with naturally occurring data, you can also measure. And you measure some causal effect under some assumptions. Using the experimental approach, you measure some causal effect. And we have our four identification assumptions and experimentation too, but it doesn't stop there because you can use subtreatments. And this is a true beauty that should be lost on, on your listeners, I hope. 
is that the true beauty behind experimentation is that the sub-treatments allow us to explore mechanisms. Why does that happen? Why do people value their time the way they do on lift? Why, why is the labor supply elasticity what it is? Why is the elasticity of demand what it is? Why does our driver acquisition program work the way it does? Why does Google work better than Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the academic is important because they bring in hypotheses and new ideas, whether it's behavioral ideas or neoclassical ideas that really help the firm go beyond AB. And once you go beyond and understand the mediators, and then understand the moderators, that gives you much, much more confidence in generalizing to other parts of the company, in generalizing to other decision-making situations or new markets or what have you. I think that's the most underappreciated element of the academic, and it's why I can go fluidly back and forth, because now I can run an exploration and I can publish it and I can help the world, but I can also help the firm. I can help the firm make better decisions or better products because I understand and I have a toolkit that will allow me to go much, much further than A-B testing. And it's a very important point to understand why academics and the business world can work in harmony and make the world a better place, but also make the firm a better place. And that's why I think that as we move along here, the chief economist is going to become one of the important go-betweens uh, between the academy and between the firm that every firm, I think, will want in, in, their, um, in their war chest. Because I, I just look at what we've done at Uber and now at Lyft. And, and, yeah. and I think you're going to see a lot of value added. The, the ROI is tremendous. All, all the CEOs who I've worked with will tell you that. And I mean, Hal Varian at Google has made a huge impact, right? There's other, Absolutely. Well, look, The Voltage Effect, it's, it's a fascinating book. It's, it's really, there's a bit of a memoir element to it, right? Where we learn a little bit about John List and his life history um, and his time at the White House, his time at companies. Uh, and, you know, we didn't even get into the section on, on optimal stopping, which I, I think is a great for uh, people who are thinking about their, their careers and how they can, uh, you know, manage it, uh, when to quit. Um, also, all sorts of studies around uh, wellness initiatives and, uh, you know, the educational stuff, which is, is really fascinating. Um, lots and lots of good stuff in here. Thank you so much, John, for joining me and hope we'll uh, talk again soon. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 